Here, we're going to build up a modern understanding of how atoms and light interact and how that leads to what we call the atomic spectrum. So, properties of the atoms that we have sussed out through years of experiments now. We know that atoms are composed of a dense nucleus that is composed of protons and neutrons. And surrounding the protons and neutrons will be the electrons in what we call a cloud orbiting the nucleus. So some key points here. Neutrons are a neutral charge object. They have no net electric charge. Protons, they have a net positive charge, whereas electrons have a net negative charge. Now, the protons and electrons will have the same magnitude of charge to the best that we can tell. They'll have the same amount of charge, but protons mean positive, electrons negative. So here are some old school models. We used to think of uh, the nucleus being protons, neutrons, and nucleus, and the electrons were kind of in this soup around the nucleus. Well, then our experiments got better, and we got to what we call the solar system model. So here the idea was like, hey, there's these positively charged protons, negatively charged electrons. Opposite charges attract, just like gravity. So here the idea is that the nucleus acts like the sun, and the electrons act like planets, stuck in these gravitational orbits around the nucleus. But now we've gone to a more modern understanding, what we call the quantum mechanical nature. So this becomes this kind of fuzzy notion of where is the electron? We still think of a proton and neutron in the nucleus, right? But the electron occupies this space, a cloud around the nucleus. We don't know exactly where in the cloud the electron is, but it's somewhere in there. Turns out it's described by waves. And this is going to be crucial. Understanding how the electron cloud interacts with the nucleus. This will be a very crucial step to seeing how photons and atoms interact. Now, in thinking about how atoms store their energy, I want you to think about bookshelves. All right? Are you the kind of person who stands your books up vertically or horizontally? Depending on what your preference is, you'll choose how to arrange your shells. You'll have shells of different distances, different heights apart from them. So your bookshelf is unique to you. And this is very similar to all the elements and molecules. They'll have different energy levels that are unique to them. So you can say there's energy store in there. Take your book, your books at say the uh, first, first shelf, and then you excite it. You put some energy into it and it goes to a higher shelf. And this is going to be very analogous to what we describe how atoms interact with photons. Similarly, if say you have a pet cat who likes to play with items and it shoves the book off a shelf, what does it do? Well, it converts its energy falling down, stubbing and slamming your toe. So the key points here, right? Everything You'll have unique bookshelves. You will build your bookshelf to suit your purposes, and it will be unique to you. Every element, every molecule will have unique energy levels. You can never store anything at a half shelf, right? If you try putting your book halfway between two shelves, well, it just falls down, right? So you can't store it at half shelves. You must ex your energies, your books must live at certain shells of energies. These are what we're gonna be calling our energy levels. And the lowest, that lowest uh, is the ground state for hopefully obvious reasons. The ground state is the lowest energy shelf. Shifting away from bookshelves, let's look at the nucleus. Here's a nucleus with a electron and a low energy level, and I want to raise its energy. So think of the book I would just grab a book and raise it up to a higher shelf. How would I raise the energy of electron? How do I lift it up? Turns out the method is to hit that electron with a photon. So this is a standard scientific convention here. We represent photons with just the Greek letter gamma, right? We're going to use gamma to represent photons, right? So you 
shoot that electron with a photon, and if it is of the right frequency, then that electron will absorb. It will absorb that photon and rise up. It will go from a lower shelf, a low energy level, to a higher energy level. Crucial thing, the energy of the photon, which correspondingly says the frequency, right? If the frequency of the photon is not the right height, the electron, the electron will just ignore it. If I try and shoot a photon that has energy that is, say, this height, then the electron will not see it. It will just go right through. Right? So the electron only absorbs the correct energy levels. It has to be the right amount of energy. Otherwise, it will just go right by. But assuming that you shot your photon with the right photon, with, with the right the electron with the right type of photon, it will absorb that energy. It will go into a bigger electron shell, a higher energy level. Now that electron is in a uh, higher energy level. How does it go down? How does the book fall down? Well, it's going to be spontaneous emission. You got an electron in a high energy level, a big electron cloud, and it's going to spit out a photon. It will shoot out a photon, radiating some energy away, and drop to a lower, lower energy level. This will be what we call emission. An electron cloud, referring to an electron in a high energy state, shooting out photons to a lower energy state. And the energy of this photon, all right, all right, HF equals the energy of that photon. The energy of that photon will match the energy of this gap. This jump here has to match the energy. The energy going from this high electron cloud to a lower shelf matches the energy that that photon will have. So once again, there is this relationship of what types of photons that atom is allowed to absorb and what type of photons that atom is allowed to radiate away. Now let's start to stitch all these things we discuss into the big pictures. Let's start pulling out the spectra. So we'll take a white light source. All that means is all these different colors of light stacked on top of each other. This light bulb tends to radiate in all these different frequencies, and when you stick them together, you see a, a white light. So we can do things to separate them, right? The light comes in, hits our telescope. The slit is just narrow it down, do not blind yes. us. Narrow, narrow it down, down focus, focus the light. light. Send, Send that, that light through, through a prism. prism. Now a property of refraction, right? and we'll discuss refraction in the next section. But the property of refraction says, hey, how much the light bends in the prism depends on its color, depends on its wavelength. And so you'll split up the colors and you'll see this nice spectrum. We've separated the colors. Going further now, this was just a white light source, right? All range of colors coming in towards us. And we get to see a full spectrum. Now let's put something in the path of the white light. Imagine there is a gas cloud, dust, between the light source and what we see. This is a very common problem in astronomy. Imagine there's a star, and somewhere between the star and us, there is molecules of gas in the way. And I've picked a molecule of gas that's really good at gobbling up the green photons. The green photons are really good at being absorbed. All the others don't match the energy levels of this gas, and so they tend to just fly on through. So after passing through this gas cloud, there'll be a missing green photons. The green photons are missing. Well, we can go through the same procedure looking at that spectrum. Isolate it, send it through a slit, focusing it down. Now split up that light that we see, spread out the colors, see the full spectrum, and look, the spectral line's missing. So we have discovered a fingerprint for this gas. If we can identify what gas, what substance, likes to gobble up these specific green photons, well then we will know what this material is. This is us doing chemical fingerprints. We are identifying what this is.
based on the types of photons it absorbs. Here are some uh, atomic, quote, fingerprints uh, of a couple atoms, helium, argon, neon, and sodium. Right? So here's the emphasis. Right? Remember that every atom has a unique spectrum of light that it will emit or absorb. So when you find these uh, spectra of these atoms, when you look out to the universe, you'll be able to identify, hey, if I look at a star and I see a spectrum like this, I see these peaks here, well, that tells me there must be argon out there. It's only for neon. Uh, for those of you who enjoy your neon lights, notice how the uh, neon likes to uh, radiate photons. There's a lot more in this yellow oranges region, hence your neon oranges glow. Specifically, we call it a neon glow. Right. How a neon light works, you take neon gas, you put it into a glass chamber, and then you put electrical leads on the ends. Right. You're using electricity to uh, excite the neon gas and get it to glow, generally around this region. Right. So furthermore, not only can we use these chemical fingerprints, these atomic spectra, to identify what's out there, we'll actually be able to figure out things like how much of an element's out there, we'll be calculating the temperature, the size of objects. Everything we'll be able to pull out is based on the light that comes to us. One more fact that I love to absolutely share. We're going to focus on helium now. Notice this bright, intense yellow. Think back to your periodic table or pull one up right now. What's number one on the periodic table? Hydrogen. Number two, helium. All right. Think of the periodic table as representing the amount of matter that you're going to find. Right? Hydrogen is the number one most abundant element in the universe. Helium is going to be second most abundant. Fun fact. Helium, even though it is the second most abundant substance in the entire universe, we did not discover helium on this planet. It wasn't until Pierre Jules Caesar was looking at the atomic spectra of the sun and he saw a color distribution like this. The yellow go glow here refers specifically to an emission helium, uh, energetic helium spitting out photons at that color. It wasn't until Pierre Jules Caesar looked at the sun, found an atomic spectra and said, I cannot explain what this peak is. He had no idea what it was. And so he had to postulate there is an element out there on the sun that we've never found here on Earth. Now following that, we're able to start finding veins of helium here on the planet. Absolutely crazy. Second most abundant thing in the entire universe and we didn't even find it on this planet. We had to look to the stars to discover it. When you're in a lab, you don't always have the benefit of being able to split, you know, get your prism out and split the colors alike this way. And we like to have a bit more than just this analog picture. So what scientists will often do is turn this amount of brightness, or dark spots here, into a graph that we can plot. And so you'd look at the wavelength of light. Remember, wavelength tells you the color versus the brightness, how many photons we've found in that region. So what you're looking at is a plot that matches this atomic spectra. Not many photons in this region. And then you'll see, see a dark spot. Dark spot corresponds to an absorption line. Right? Dark spot here, a absorption. The atom likes to absorb photons of this color range. And so this is how we tend to convert from seeing as analog picture spreading the colors out with a prism to something that we can very easily analyze in a computer to calculate process more. Instead of just comparing slides, we'll compare the plots of the data.